good morning. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Elliot Dam. I'm the founder of Carrera Consulting in Chicago, and I'm an alumnus of the Council's Emerging Leader Program. Thank you for joining us uh, for business security in the global 5G competition. Before we start, I'd like to give a special thanks to DLA Piper, McKinsey and Company, for their support as sponsors of the Council. I want to remind you that the council is an independent and nonpartisan or membership organization. Positions or views of the council. The next 45 minutes, we're going to discuss the next generation of wireless technology, 5G. Uh, after the moderated discussion, we'll incorporate questions uh, from the audience. So please go in your browser to ccga.live. Ccga.live to submit a question or vote for any questions that you may like, and we'll devote at least 15 minutes at the end of this session uh, to address those questions. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. First, we have Ben Lurie. He's a senior partner at McKinsey & Company in Chicago. Meg King is the Director of Science and Technology at the Wilson Center. And Edward Smitty Smith is the Deputy Office Managing Partner at DLA Piper in Washington. A very distinguished panel, and I think we will cover a lot of dimensions on what is a complex, uh, very impactful issue coming in the next couple of years. I wanted to start this off by getting a basic level set with the audience about what 5G is, how it differs from 4G, you know, first world users are used to on their smartphones, what we've been used to now in, in during the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, but we want to understand, you know, what can 5G do? What are some examples of industries that are going to be revolutionized by 5G? What are some new industries that don't even exist yet that will appear as a result of 5G? And what are some emerging areas of opportunity that are still in the labs, but that will emerge? Venkat, I want to pass that over to you based on all of your experience with new and emerging businesses in this space. Compare and contrast between 4G and uh, 5G. Uh, in terms of the capabilities, and I'll get into a couple of the other areas that you mentioned as well. Uh, first, on the on the capabilities, uh, if you look at the core capabilities of any wireless network, uh, you typically look at um, what's the peak data speed, for example. Uh, in 4G versus 5G, there would be an order of magnitude faster speed, um, you know, depending on how you measure and um, whose claims you believe in, it could be as high as 10 times or more, uh, 10 times or more faster than you would see uh, in terms of the speeds for 4G versus 5G. Similarly, if you look at um, the number of devices covered, you know, if you take a dimension or take a, a metric like uh, connections per square kilometer, uh, with 4G, you may get, you know, you know hundreds of thousands of um, um, users on a square kilometer coverage cover network. In 5G, with various bands of spectrum that gets deployed, that could go up to a million, for example. And then the other very interesting capability that gets uh, talked a lot about uh, is the latency. Uh, latency is defined as how fast, if you send something to someone, the other person would receive it. Um, so again, Typical latency for 4G would be in a, in a 10 millisecond range, and, and depending on um, you know, the, whose claims you believe in and measure, uh, how you measure it, you know, it could be in 5G uh, less than a second. So if you look at those three broad dimensions, you could see that there is an order of magnitude change in the capabilities from 4G to, uh, 4G to 5G, I should say. Um, in, in terms of, um, you know, the, the types of areas or types of uh, users, uh, end users slash, you know, user uh, use cases uh, would potentially benefit from these order of magnitude better capabilities in 5G, there are several. There are obvious ones, uh, like autonomous driving, where, you know, this capability could enhance uh, the rate at which, you know, the, the technology could get deployed, or rate at which, you know, the, uh, the cost curve could get, uh, you know, more and more efficient. That's, a, that's an obvious example. Again, it gets talked about a lot. Uh, it's probably, you know, here and now, but it probably may take, you know, quite a bit of time to penetrate into the broader market in the auto space. And there's also other examples. Um, you know, you could imagine a world where if the, if the speed at which the, the data getting, uh, you know, transferred is order of magnitude better, you know, 10 times better than what you see in 4G, 
you could potentially substitute your broadband, the fixed broadband you have today, with a 5G connection. Uh, that would be a very interesting uh, you know, opportunity, especially you know, areas where, remote areas where you know, the broadband speeds may not be as high, and if you deploy 5G, that could be a very interesting opportunity. And I'll tell you maybe uh, one other uh, broad, maybe uh, also a more futuristic um, example uh, that, that could evolve. Um, again, AR, uh, sorry, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, you know, gets talked about, you know, in various uh, degrees. Uh, then there are the, the, the opportunities are limitless in my view, uh, in terms of what AR, VR could do with 5G. Imagine a world where, you know, you can instantly get the reaction to the command you send on your application or the data, uh, data stream that you want to get access to. That's kind of capability that would re revolutionize, in my view, the types of uh, VR, AR um, use cases that, that could evolve. I'll give you just a very practical example. The way you shop today in the retail setting could you know, um, fundamentally change with this 5G capability. Uh, similarly, the way that you, for example, if you're on the market for buying a house, uh, the way you would view um, what you might be interested in from buying a house, um, the kind of capabilities that you could get to view the rooms that you imagine putting furniture in those rooms or furnishings in the rooms and, and reimagine how that would look. That capability is in the primitive stages now, but with 5G, you could have a massive, massive, um, massive different you know, uh, experience that's brought, uh, much more compelling in, in our view. I'm going to pause there. Uh, hopefully that will answer or at least address the key aspects of uh, the, the opening remarks you made, uh, yet, uh, and I'm going to throw it back to you to see if we have any follow-up questions on that. Yeah, I think that, that's great. And, and I think, you know, as we start with 4G and more advanced smartphones, there, there are industries and, in, in, you know, social, political, and business opportunities that we, that we can never have foreseen, and it's really a matter of getting the technology out there to see what some of the other possibilities are going to be. Um, but other things that we do know now in addition to what you raised, you know, there's some significant security concerns. And I think one of the one of the objectives of this panel was to look at some of those major security risks associated with the broader deployment of 5G. And so and so Meg, given given your background in, in looking at security with the Wilson Center, I wanted to, you know, start with the, the discussion of the technology supply chain. Right? There's been a lot of press about this, and we'll get to Huawei and all those things in subsequent questions, but I, I really want to understand. What are the national security implications? What does this mean for information sharing among countries? And then what does it mean for big tech? Because we're dominated, our lives are dominated by big tech today, um, and it's an enabler in our lives. What does that mean in terms of what we'll be able to do, and how does the intersect with, with personal opportunity intersect with, with national security and trade policy? And at the end of the day, who's really responsible for the security? Is it the technology company, companies? Is it the governments? Does that relationship need to change or how should we think about that? Sure, well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, before even uttering the H word, um, I think it's important to realize that there are many pieces to the 5G security puzzle. Um, ultimately, if we're gonna talk about the US government, um, the US government wants reliability, availability, and integrity of 5G networks. Um, there are two major security risks to think about from a, a strategic perspective. Um, nation states, special access to networks to spy on others, and then the vulnerabilities when the billions and trillions of IoT devices and eventually sensors connect to sensitive networks. In my opinion, it's the second risk that's more dangerous. Even if the U.S. were able to exclude Chinese technology and increase 5G security re resilience domestically, military operations for abroad, for example, would still be reliant on the security and resilience of networks in place outside U.S. borders. So, for example, if a U.S. ship docks in the port of a country with a dirty network, as they like to call it, how do we ensure that the integrity of their communications remains secure? Where do the security uh, risks exist? So, as 5G network deployments uh, happen, um, they will include significant expansions of small cells that connect over untrusted networks. There's device-to-device -device communications, and then there are devices connecting to multiple cells at once. So the threat landscape is increasing the number of intrusion points exponentially. That's 
a bit of a challenge for cybersecurity to how to manage that scale. There are some automation options there, um, but really what we're looking at is um, if you're thinking about the supply chain, we have to, of course, think about the hardware points um, that we need to secure and make sure um, are hardened is the term that's used and that we know what's in them or that it we at least can regularly test and verify. But it's really the software that's um, abstract and tangible, but that gives us pause as we're trying to navigate these security concerns. The good news is there are some solutions. So in fact, a, a number of cybersecurity companies have laid out helpful charts simplifying the 5G supply chain and where security in their view, which is a different, slightly different in each case, should be placed. Um, but to take one step back quickly, um, there's a you need to have a little bit of a history of, of, of the cybersecurity evolution. We used to talk about how um, threats existed outside the perimeter, and we used terms uh, like firewall as a critical tool. That's no longer the case. It hasn't been for a while. We've moved to a place where we expect breach, but we want to lock out intruders from any sensitive data that they might obtain. So there are a number of ways to do this. A popular one is called zero trust, where that's similar if you know anything about the government to compartmentalize security classification systems to keep secrets safe. Basically, you cordon all the crown jewels while laying breadcrumbs around so you can tell when an unauthorized adversary is nearby and users are given restrictions and clear access levels. Um, so if you're at home, working from home in this COVID crisis, for example, um, one of the tools that we use now is, is virtual private networks where we have encrypted tunnels between your system and then wherever you're connecting to to get sensitive information. Um, most of us, once you're logged in, you've got full access. But if you use this zero-based trust concept, which a lot of the private sector is starting to implement and we have experience in the government in using, um, we can um, um, and add restrictions and know who's going where when. Uh, and so like I mentioned, a lot of this process can be automated. So if you take the perspective of what the US government is concerned about in the 5G world, um, and you layer that onto uh, the consumer uh, and, the, and the private sector view of this, there's some overlap, but there's not a lot. And so what we're gonna need to do is be pretty creative and understand that there will not be one solution that there will need to be many solutions uh, and that we need to have some very clear objectives in mind as we're, as we're moving forward. The good news is that I think there are a lot of, I know there are a lot of contracting options and partnership models for the private sector to work with the government and they're already doing that from the Department of Homeland Security um, working on a test bed, the name for testing um, the whole supply chain of, of 5G technologies through to, um, to roundtables and partnerships with the private sector to help consumers understand what their risks are. Luckily, those risks are probably less than those of the of the government. And the government is mostly, if you think about it in the simple simple way, it's nation state risk to nation states and some businesses. Uh, and then on the consumer side, it remains the criminal ransomware opportunistic piece, which is important and costs a lot of money. And so I think if, if we can think of those two tracks, we can use some lessons that we have learned um, previously in, in the cybersecurity space and apply them in a way that makes sense. And we can get the private sector and the government working together. Um, and there is good some more good news. Um, I seem to be optimistic today in that the president signed the Secure 5G Act in March, which requires a national strategy, they've already issued it, to help um, the private sector work with the government to better secure our networks domestically and also work with our allies internationally to figure out how we can uh, apply lessons learned. Of course, it all matters how we implement it, but at least there are now some mechanisms for getting organized. Um, the government, ultimately, to answer your question about who's responsible, the government's responsible for protecting government networks. And the private sector, for the most part, depending on, uh, and I'd leave that to Smitty to answer um, some very specific legal requirements, have um, requirements based on who they are, what their business is for protecting, and that gets really muddy really fast. Um, but if, if you're the government, you have to protect yourself, and if you're consumers, you've got to rely on a variety of service providers. So that's a bit of a challenge for consumers going forward. It's all uh -huh. Absolutely, and I appreciate you highlighting the, the military aspect too. Um, you know, I certainly wasn't as aware that their you know, military operations are dealing with dirty networks like the rest of us are, and that you know, end-to-end -end encryption is really a very important aspect of how we can assure that, that uh, unintended consequences are, are minimized. Um, 
Yes, but what happens on those endpoints is really important because we we are still the weakest link, the human piece. So sorry. absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so with that, you know, encryption and and the and the and human link are are certain things that, that we need to look at. Um, at the same time, as we get into deploying 5G to open up some of the business opportunities that that Venkat was was addressing, you know, there, there's some questions about what equipment is brought in, right? This is, you know, where I wanted to bring up the, the famous Huawei question. And as, as you know, I saw in, in some of the Wilson Center's work, Huawei is, is just one of many things that, that you like to talk about in terms of risk. Right now, uh, from my point of view, really the risk there is that they're competing very, very well on a price performance perspective. And so if, if I'm an operator and I want to roll out a 5G network, that's a very attractive offering. Ericsson and Nokia have other offerings, but it's, it's a competitive marketplace. But in dealing with those risks that you outlined, I, I want to go to Smitty and ask, what are some of the regulatory implications? How should we think about helping telecommunication companies compete while not creating undue security or diplomatic risks, even, even on our home soil here or as you know, multinational mobile operators move into markets? You know, the, the Vodafones of the world, if they, if they address many different markets, how do you make those selections? What is the regulatory uh, environment look like? And, and, and starting with how do we think about that from a United States of America perspective? Sorry, I had to unmute. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. I, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this during my time at the uh, FCC. Um, the environment has changed substantially since then, and um, and it's become an even more sensitive issue. Uh, I mean, you know. The big age, Huawei is currently the number one telecom supplier, number two phone manufacturer in the world. So, you know, it obviously commands tremendous market power. And um, its position and its success are due to a range of factors, and not the least of which is the you know, backing of and support of the Chinese government and many of the practices that the Chinese government has taken, whether directly or indirectly, to provide Huawei with a certain competitive advantage uh, over its global competitors, such as the ones you mentioned, you know, Nokia, Ericsson. Um, you know, the uh, you know both Huawei and ZTE, uh, you know, who are the number one and I think now number four uh, equipment suppliers in the country uh, in, the, in the world uh, for uh, network deployment, um, you know, are national champions, and so uh, you know they're a great focus of the Chinese government, and therefore, uh, accordingly, they're also a great focus of the U.S. government. Uh, and you know, what is it that we can do to make sure that we are maintaining the security of our networks, and to Meg's point, the security of networks internationally because the U.S. government looks at this not purely from the perspective of domestic networks, but also uh, the, the networks that you know, our uh, citizens and our soldiers are connecting to abroad. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. There's a long history behind this. Um, I mean, if, if you look at the top five uh, providers of, uh, of this uh, network equipment uh, globally, uh, you'll find on the list no U.S. suppliers. Uh, you know, we have Huawei that's Chinese, we have ZTE that's Chinese, you know, at number two and number three, we have Nokia and Ericsson, so Finland and Sweden, um, and, you know, and Samsung is starting to get into it, um, but, you know, it's still a relatively new entrant, uh, new entrant on the uh, network equipment side, uh, huge, obviously, on the mobile device side. And, uh, and, and this is the result of, um, you know, a lot of things that we don't have time to get into now, but essentially the collapse of the U.S. Uh, um, network equipment manufacturing base uh, back in the late 90s and 2000, early 2000s when we lost Motorola and, uh, and Lucent um, and then Canadian company Nortel. So um, in that vacuum, Huawei has become dominant uh, and they now, I think, represent about 28% of the world market. Um, and our, the U.S. response uh, and, you know, from being in a difficult position has been uh, several fold. Um, you know, one proposal, which I view with some skepticism, um, but is something that's been advanced, uh, you know, by uh, higher ups in this administration have been uh, to affirmably acquire something like a stronger position in the network infrastructure market. So uh, Attorney General Barr, who has a telecom background, used to be with, uh, the general counsel of at and pushed forward the notion of, uh, Affirmative Ameri you know, efforts to increase American ownership in some of our uh, in, in some of Huawei's competitors. Um, so uh, acquiring a controlling stake in Nokia or Ericsson. Um, you know, another approach uh, that's been floated has been uh, to uh, 
reduce the 5G dependency on uh, those types of devices by uh, focusing on open radio access networks, ORANs. Um, and so there's been some talk about government funding to explore uh, the use of ORANs to sort of supplement or, or, or replace the need to uh, have uh, uh, you know, Huawei or ZTE equipment on some of our networks. Now, it's important to note that like none of the big tier one providers uh, domestically, uh, so you know, Verizon, T-Mobile, uh, which is now T-Mobile, Sprint Merge, uh, or AT&T uh, have Huawei or ZTE equipment. So largely, this is a concern for your small providers, your uh, rural providers in many cases. Um, and they're, of course, attracted to the prospect, or they had been attracted to purchasing uh, Huawei or uh, ZTE because of the fact that uh, they were, as you said before, price competitive. Um, and, you know, the third way that, uh, you know, that, that policymakers and uh, have been looking at this and trying to figure out how do we, um, you know, sort of address the, the dominance of, of the Chinese manufacturers in this field uh, have been through uh, an array of trade sessions, formal bans with respect to Huawei and ZTE equipment and, and domestic networks, um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, press, pressuring uh, for, you know, purchases of American groups uh, and, and federal subsidies. Um, and then using uh, trade agreements and our negotiations with some of our allies to try to convince them to similarly do so in their networks abroad. Uh, so uh, we've been applying a lot of pressure to the UK. The UK has uh, not gone as far as having a complete ban, but has gone so far as putting restrictions on uh, the use of these uh, technologies in core networks um, and uh, in, in, on, on sensitive parts of the networks. So. Um, I'll say, you know, as far as you know, where I see things going, um, I think that I'm, I'm very skeptical about the sort of large scale viability of effectively trying to compete with Chinese manufacturers through the use of, uh, of, of uh, you know, ORANs, uh, the open radio access networks, at least in any sort of reasonable uh, time frame as we you know, push, push, push and rush towards a quick deployment of 5G technology uh, nationally. Um, you know, I. Uh, am equally skeptical of the prospects of uh, you know U.S. purchasing and controlling ownership shares in a uh, you know in, in Huawei's competitors in Nokia or Ericsson. Um, you know, generally speaking, uh, for what has made the U.S. successful uh, through uh, 3G and 4G uh, and, and made us a really a, a leader internationally uh, on uh, wireless technology. Uh, has been creating a market environment that uh, will allow for effective competition and innovation in the private sector, having you know, government focusing on making sure that we preserve uh, you know, open and free markets that, uh, and through that competition, making sure that we have uh, thereby achieve better results, better products, better services uh, that themselves uh, you know, rise to the top through market competition. Um, and that is even in the face of uh, heavily government subsidized competition from something like a China, uh, a China manufacturer. Um, so, you know, the FCC is uh, not very good at trying to come up with new ways to, um, to build companies, but it's very good at creating the environment for uh, private success. And so, uh, you know, what we're seeing the FCC do and what the FCC should continue to do is going to be focusing on uh, making sure that the resources are available, spectrum being a, a major part of that, are available to um, to 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 uh, U.S. domestic carriers, and that those domestic carriers can then, uh, you know, be creating the demand necessary to, um, you know, to to to, to you know uh, to, to to build out the network necessary to, to justify the build out of their networks, such as to uh, provide more business to the supplier base that they already have, the Nokia's and the Ericsson's. Sure, sure. Well, uh, clearly that open access and creating of an environment where new businesses can compete is going to be critical to the overall return and investment on 5G and, and to allow the private sector to, to innovate. Um, also, just going back to some of the things I said before, I think it's also helpful to think about the difference between the network and then the traffic that's coming over the network and the traffic and the way that that is uh, deployed, encrypted, or consumed as being ways in which we can think about security as well. I wanted to go over to you, Venkat, for a minute and just say, you know, how can the, how can the broader tech sector or some of those, you know, downstream companies that Smitty's talking about respond? Are there opportunities for entrepreneurs or, you know, larger scale companies that would 
uh, embrace open source or other types of encryption or other things that, that would increase not only security, but also consumer confidence and consumer adoption of new technologies. You know, thinking about it another way, what are some key success factors for emergent businesses that want to take advantage of the adoption curve in 5G? Uh, there, there are. Um, so let, let me maybe start with um, uh, the, uh, the, the evolution of the network itself. Uh, one of the very, uh, really fascinating things that's happening with 5G is, you know, some of this is to be expected is that more and more of the network capabilities, network infrastructure is actually migrating from hardware to software. Um, and so the, I'm sure um, you heard the software defined network phrase, you know, we heard the, the, the uh, network function virtualization phrase. So all those, all those phrases that get talked about a lot in the industry is, you know, a different way of saying is that more and more of the network infrastructure would go from hardware focused, a lot more software defined and software enabled and software focused. Well, the question is, so why is that, you know, that exciting? Well, it's exciting because uh, with that software enablement of the network, um, you will have more opportunities um, for entrepreneurs and other others to really tap into that capability, the capability to do a couple of things. One, capability to, to reimagine the experiences that you could provide. Um, you know, it, early on in the conversation, I mentioned AR, VR. I mean, imagine a world where you have less than a millisecond latency and you have access to uh, parts of the network that are more software defined. And you could you know, imagine the types of applications you could develop. And, and, and um, you know, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a phrase that we've been using with you know, some of our conversations with the industry players that's called um, tactile internet. Um, and it's a different way of saying, uh, you, you can actually get to very, very close proximity of uh, uh, feeling things on the internet because the latency is so low, you get really high resolution, Things that you would see in, you know, even 2D, pseudo 3D on the internet, they actually would, you know, feel and 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 uh, uh, you can you can have interactions with the the objects in a very tactile way. I wasn't before. So with that tactile internet concept, you know, um, there are all kinds of different opportunities that would open up um, that are primarily software driven. So one of the success factors would be take advantage of the software capabilities and reimagine the way things get done, whether it's retail, whether it's real estate, whether it's a factory floor, I think that you know, the, the, um, the opportunities are limitless in that. And the second area, before we, we, we wrap this part of the conversation up, that we also you know, be great to think about is the, um, you know, always look back from what typical or what you know, particular um, problem are you trying to solve for, uh, for, 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 for consumers? Uh, and there are a variety of them, right? And the, the, the problem is could be associated with the experience the consumers are facing or the exp uh, associated with the cost that you could reduce for, you know, um, the, the, the cost as in the, the physical cost of like dollars and cents. The cost could also be the experiential cost that you could, you know, uh, you could potentially reduce. And I think what Smithy talked about for ORAN and, you know, uh, the CRAN and how, more and more of this capability is going to go on to cloud and software. You be able to solve a lot of problems, uh, whether it's hard, you know, dollar and some problems or expensive problems, uh, in a way that you weren't able to do it in the past. So that's the other success factor to you know reimagine and think about ways in which you could solve the problems that you were not able to solve uh, with the, using these technology and capabilities. I'm going to pause there, Elliot. Perhaps uh, and we can open up for for questions. Yeah, I think we want to we want to leave time for the audience now. We've had a number of questions, and I just I want to encourage everyone who uh, still has a question to go to ccga.live to ask your questions. Um, in transition to that, you know, I know that, that we're all living through a, a major inflection point in terms of how life is is proceeding on the planet in in sort of the midst or hopefully flattening of the COVID nineteen epidemic. We've got a variety of other challenges related to personal safety, social justice, things like that. And one of the things that, that, you know, one of the places in which that is really uh, most challenging is in cities around the world. We, we went into 2020 still with lots of talk about smart cities and how do cities become more intelligent. And there've been many questions about that uh, from the audience. I just want to ask, 
in, as the world changes or moves to its next phase after this epidemic, and we start to look back in terms of how do cities function uh, more efficiently or more equitably or um, you know, more appropriately, what is the role of 5G and, and how can cities leverage that in order to, to grow in those fashions? And I'll, I'll, I'll you know, open that up to, to any of the panelists who, who have a point of view on that. And then maybe I can jump with uh, the perspective on this and I'd love for others to, um, others to add on as well. So there's a whole concept of smart cities has been around for a while. Um, and we, we've been um, working with various um, stakeholders in the smart city space for a while. You know, the, I would say that the, um, so far uh, the success has been quite mixed. Um, and there are some, you know, big city projects that get talked about a lot, but, but overall, you know, the, the success has been mixed, right? But I, I personally do think that um, there are a level of capabilities that 5G offers uh, that would improve or that dramatically improve the ability for ability for cities to um, offer either services for you know um, the citizens or for um, for offer security types of security or um, in, in types of uh, you know more confidence that you could drive in in in, 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 in citizenry as well. So I'll give you an example. In the past, you know, if you want to put um, either sensors or other equipment on light poles and things like that um it was it was it's a bit of a mess uh you have to think through all kinds of different things um, but with 5g that could become quite straightforward because you'll have the capacity um uh, going back to the capacity point i talked about right um and you know on top of that you can also think about you know what are the uh what are the compelling things that you could offer you know citizens of the city um, using the technology with the low latency type applications uh, that would be quite helpful for them. Um, so I think, the, 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 again, the, uh, the opportunities are limitless. You just have to reimagine a certain things that you're offering as a city uh, and then use the technology to, to provide them. Sure. And, you know, just to sort of follow up with Limcat's point and the point that he made earlier about sort of one of the applications of 5G technology, uh, autonomous vehicles uh, or would be a good example of how it can change how our cities may work and how it may layer in with sort of a 5G smart city. Um, you know, right now, uh, this is, you know, the technology is not advanced to the point where this is feasible, but uh, when we reach a point at which uh, we have networks that are ubiquitous enough, particularly in city centers where you're going to be able to use millimeter wave spectrum, very high band spectrum, tremendous amounts of capacity, with that kind of capacity, it's very easy to imagine a world in which we have, you know, fully automated vehicles and fleets that are moving through the city in a coordinated way that are, you know, perhaps moving slower than the traffic is today, and yet getting you to your ultimate endpoint faster because we've got coordination throughout the city on, uh, you know, with, with a fully integrated network such that, uh, you know, each car can optimize its routes and we limit the amount of uh, congestion and traffic that currently slow down our travel. So we might have cars or vehicles moving slower, getting to where they need to go faster with fewer pedestrian deaths and, uh, and, and greater efficiency from an energy standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, there are lots of ways that we can think about this. I mean, one last thing, I, I know we've got to move quickly. You mentioned COVID and the COVID pandemic. Um, and we think about this in the context of you know, populations and, and, and particularly in cities like, uh, you know, where, where we're seeing these as being sort of the, the epicenters of outbreaks. Uh, the, you know, the COVID challenge is largely a data challenge. Um, you know, it, it, it's a question of, uh, you know, who's infected, where are they, who have they had contact with, and how do we treat them? And um, if you imagine a 5G world where we have more ubiquitous devices, wearables, things like that, you're stepping into a world in which it's much easier to know who is sick because our wearables can track our temperature and can track our vital signs. It's much easier to know where they've been and where they are, who they've had contact with. And then through telehealth resources, we can also provide them with viable options for treatment. Now, of course, you know, this creates a whole slew of other challenges with respect to data privacy, security, and things like that. But um, you know, the, the potential here is right now nearly limitless. Yeah. 
Great. Meg, Meg, I want to bring you in, but I want to collapse a couple other questions that we're getting about, about intelligence sharing and security. And so one is a question, uh, you know, how will the relationship between the USA and other countries be affected based on those other countries' uh, desire to adopt uh, certain suppliers' technologies? Uh, and then secondarily, even if uh, Huawei or ZTE or other, other technologies are chosen, is there not a way or could we not formulate a way where we could definitively understand whether those were clean or dirty networks or they pass a certain level of uh, testing in order to give them you know, a different uh, all clear flag or different type of uh, criteria? Sure. Um, as uh, I'll just take one um, on the on the COVID piece really quickly, and then go to the Intel piece. Um, I have a three year old who has a tendency to always get um, uh, in in some sort of mischief, and uh, I'm calling the doctor more often than I, I should. Um, and so I've had my own experience with telehealth during this period. And you think we have all of these abilities, but on the current bandwidth, it's it's you know like we still get shaky video and you can't be sure that you're reliably testing, you know, with my home thermometer that that's the accurate, you know, temperature. And so what we will hopefully get to at a point with 5G builds on what Smitty um, mentioned is that we will have more reliable data that we can use. And yes, of course, we're going to need to protect it and think about that carefully, which is one of my policy prescriptions, hopefully, is we need some sort of IoT um, a certification standard, which is very hard, but we've got to get there. Um, so that's my piece on telehealth. On intelligence, um, we don't use 5G to transmit um, the most sensitive intelligence um, secrets that we share with our allies, period. Um, we have a very long history with the Five Eyes Intelligence Group, as well as other strong allies uh, in sharing information. Sometimes that's leaked just because of um, let's just say politicians who haven't been careful about how they've been briefed. Um, it doesn't have to be a technology problem. Um, and so uh, relationships will exist. They will continue to exist. Um, we will have our public disputes, but behind the scenes, we will remain lock solid. I'm quite sure with our current allies. So not worried about that. Um, but it will be hard um, as more and more of our capabilities are technological. Um, and we've actually faced this in the, in the human intelligence how how do we um, protect the the covert status of some of our most secret assets and sources? Um, and if and as we're thinking about that, how do they communicate? They can't communicate on these five G networks. They they will have to find other ways to do that. And so we're just going to have to be very creative, and we're going to have to find ways to constantly test to use. Um, to use threat indicators that we know about and to look for um, suspicious kinds of activity um, on our lower networks and make sure that our upper level networks aren't penetrated. Um, it's just going to be a constant battle. Um, the, the good news, I guess I'm, I'm still an optimist here, is that we've had so much experience on the security side and we've had time to assess who's capable and which nation state is capable of, of what, um, that we know what their tactics and techniques are. And so we're watching that and we can be aware of what the risks are and walk into certain situations with a level of certainty to the extent we can about what is really risky and what isn't. And so it will be vigilance and it'll be some 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 warning in, in advance. So there, there, there's certainly a lot of work to be done from a governmental standpoint, from a private sector standpoint, with lots of opportunity. But you know, we've had a couple other questions from the audience about what does this mean in terms of the impact on the end consumer, or we could expand that to say the impact on, on, the, on the taxpayer, what have you? Is this something where there's going to need to be a significant step function in terms of funding and costs that's passed on, or is this really just more a natural evolution of, of wireless technologies that have been you know, worked on over the past you know, 25, 30 years? How should the end consumer think about the impacts of 5G to them and, and to their wallet. Venkat, I think we, you're on mute. Uh, me now? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, okay. Now, I was just saying that um, this is an idea that, uh, we did uh, do a bit of thinking on. So, you know, whenever there is a, a significant technology development like this, uh, what typically ends up happening is, uh, the, in, in the economic or economic terms, um, we will have a um, shift of consumer surplus from one group to the other. 
Um, so in our view, obviously for 5G capabilities to get deployed, uh, the service providers or the carriers um, have to spend a ton of you know, capital expenditure um, to put the, uh, put the capabilities in place for the network, right? And you know they obviously have to get you know the, the return for their share uh, the, the the shareholders. Um, so the question is, you know, this is is this going to cost more for you, or is it how is that you know the consumer surplus aspect you know gets transferred? But I think the, the way we would think about that is, um, uh, imagine a world where you know all of a sudden you don't really have to go to a retail store or you don't have to go you know spend a lot of time, you know, searching for real estate, you know, or the house that you're buying, or in the, imagine a world where a lot of that, you know, can be, a lot of those applications can be done, you know, virtually. Obviously, that is providing you some sort of, a, you know, convenience and, and giving you some value, right? So, if there's, there's going to have to be a, a, a value placed on that, and the value sharing, you know, that has to happen. So, you may shift some of what you would have, you know, um, spent on, uh, other aspects of the shopping experience, you may shift that to maybe spend that money on uh, an application that you would subscribe to on a monthly basis to enable you to do so, those kinds of things. So, so you can save money or save time and you know, save some energy on your side as well. So I think there would be quite a few shifts like that of consumer surplus from one group to the other. Uh, and, and you know, it, it remains to be seen. It, it, the whole 5G evolution is so early uh, in the... Um, uh, in, in the in in, in the uh, ecosystem cycle, uh, I think it'd be too early to say, but but we would definitely imagine that that would happen. Uh, a good example would be you know ten you know fifteen years ago, who would have thought that you know there'd be a company called you know Uber that would have that would take the um, uh, the whole uh, the, the 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 taxi market by surprise, and you know there's obviously a, a quite a bit of consumer plus that got be distributed there as well. So I think there would be many examples like that that would happen. Okay, that's that, that's great. I mean, I think that 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 there will certainly be lots of innovation and with the Uber example. There are many things that we can't really think about uh, in terms, we can't really envision in terms of products that revolution our lives, revolutionize our lives. But there certainly be ways to pay for it that will work for the market, and there will be many competitive dynamics around that. We've got about a minute left, and I just want to hit one more question that's coming up. Um, many many people have read studies talking about the health impacts of five G. And I think, I think there's many things that are known, there are many things that are unknown. We can't really do that in justice in 60 seconds, but if any of the panelists had some resources they could point our audience to, to sort of learn more about the health impacts of 5G and where they can get more information about that, I think that there's many questions in the audience about, about that dimension. Uh, do do you know of anything? Let me let me pass it over to Smitty. Do you know anything from a le regulatory standpoint or governmental standpoint, uh, yeah. where or studies that, that that are going on? Yeah. So um, it, the 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 concern that you cite uh, is is one that has received a, a tremendous amount of uh, amplification uh, in uh, in the internet, <laughs> um, and you know largely what. You know, you're talking about is this this fear that uh, with these ubiquitous networks, you're going to have base stations everywhere, and you will have an in increase in network densification with more base stations uh, throughout you know your cities. And, and but these are, um, I think it's important to realize that the uh, that the energy levels that we're talking about, the power levels that these transmissions are happening at, if, um, are, are not so high as to uh, create uh, any real. Uh, you know, health concern or health risk, and there's been lots of there's been lots of research on that and the effect of radio waves on human cells, and um, and so while I don't have a link to direct you to right now. What I can tell you is um, that you know, uh, you know, we looked at this at the FCC. Uh, you know, we've looked at this you know elsewhere through the government throughout U.S. government. The fact of the matter is that um, you know for the types of exposure, the length of exposure, the um, at the power levels that people um, are typically exposed to them, uh, you know, the health consequences are um, you know negligible to non-existent. Um, and uh, but I do understand that's something that a lot of people are very concerned about. I've even heard things such as COVID was caused by 5G. So you know we're going to find all sorts of interesting things out there. Um, but uh, you know from a, from a practical standpoint, um, you know. For, for, for your you know consumer use uh, and for you know your, your type of exposure 
uh, this is not something that is going to create a hell of a problem. Well, certainly the internet chamber and there can be many things that, that that get a lot of attention that may not be very factually based but it's good to know that this is is something that's being looked at and being studied and there's it would be ongoing look at all sorts of wireless technologies and power you know i might be a little bit more concerned about the the microwave popcorn i'm about to make in a little bit rather than a 5g network but certainly it's something to keep an eye on i think with that we're at time and i want to thank our panelists for for all of your insights and um I want to thank our audience for, for joining the council live here, and I'm going to turn it over back to the council and our hosts to, to wrap up. Thank you again for the opportunity to host this, this panel.